Thank you. Uh, welcome, everyone, to our talk on uh, Ralph Breaks the Internet, Building the Internet um, for Wreck-It Ralph 2. Uh, you got this reminder already, so uh, I'll leave that there for a beat. I am Ernie Petty. I was the technical supervisor on Ralph Breaks the Internet. Um, had the same role back on uh, Zootopia. I'm Larry Wu. I'm the head of environments. These are some of my past shows. Uh, I was here four years ago for Big Hero 6, maybe five. And uh, click, click. Yeah, I'm Dave Kay. Um, I'm the head of characters and technical animation on Ralph. Cool. Cool. Uh, so we were thrilled to work again on this film with uh, Oscar winning director Rich Moore and the uh, writer director Phil Johnston, who was the team that brought us the original Wreck It Ralph as well as working on Zootopia. And uh, also joining us were executive producers Jennifer Lee from Frozen and Chris Williams from Big Hero 6. So it's been a fantastic creative team to work with uh, on creating this film. Um, also producer Clark Spencer. So when we started off with uh, um, hearing that this movie would be taking place in the internet, we first turned to the creative teams and said, we need to think about what it means to make an animated version of the internet that feels like the real internet. We turned to our animation team and said, we need you guys to go off, uh, do some research, and then come up with some, some brilliant concepts on what the internet is in an animated world. And so they did, they went off, they came back, and they showed this. Cat videos. So yes, that is that is definitely representative of of the internet. Uh, and, and we said this this is fantastic. Um, but obviously, the internet is a big, broad place, and it goes well beyond this. So go off and, and what more? What let's let's get some broader ideas out there. So they did. Took a little bit. Came back with this. <laughs> And we were really stunned. I mean, the, the work they did was amazing. It really captures the heart of what the internet is. But, but we thought that maybe the internet could be a little bit more than that as well for our movie. So we said one more time, okay, let, let's dig really deep here, get all our creative juices flowing, and, and what, what is the internet? So, uh, so animation was all set. We knew they could do what was needed to be done. <laughs> so uh, next, we, the, we turned to the rest of our teams, our environment teams, and, and research is really important for our movies. If we look at uh, some of our past experiences, for example, on Zootopia, the, the team went to Kenya to study safari, real, real animals, to, to get inspired for creating the movie. Uh, Moana, there were, there were trips to the Pacific Islands in order to make that film feel authentic in, in Pacific and its cultures. And in Frozen, of course, the team traveled to Norway to uh, learn all about the architecture and, and nature there for the Kingdom of Arendelle. So for Ralph Breaks the Internet, we followed a similar line and uh, drove 10 miles to uh, downtown Los Angeles and won Wilshire Boulevard. And while it's not necessarily the same sort of exotic as Pacific Islands or Africa, we found that it is an incredible building that houses, you know, a central hub of communication for the internet for, for Southern California. Uh, it, it's a building with miles and miles of wire rooms that are floor to ceiling wires that uh, we're told do not touch anything, because if any of these disconnect, we're not really sure what they do or what could go down. So it, it was inspiring in the research, and when you see all these cables lining uh, the walls and running everywhere, it did give that early test concept that maybe the internet could have a concept that feels like a city with uh, interconnections of traffic going everywhere between it. So this did really help kick us off in our exploration of building the internet. So let's take a look at the research that we did and how we kind of implemented and did some testing with it. Uh, here we have our, a photo of a motherboard. So our director of cinematography, uh, Brian Leach, we wanted to kind of 
see what it looks like as a kind of aerial shot of a city here and kind of an early exploration of what the internet could look like. Uh, Matthias uh, Lechner, our art director of production of environments, uh, he, he kind of did this SketchUp model just to kind of see how uh, taking like 45 degree uh, angles and kind of the motherboard pattern and making a city from there, how that would look like. Um, also, here is kind of Mr. Litwack's office. Uh, you know, he has all old stuff and he also, uh, you know, kind of plug in a Wi-Fi router. And here we want to represent Mr. Litwag as a net, like a little avatar. And Dave will get into kind of that stuff later. And then how information is packaged together and sent. And then from our research, uh, you know, it, it goes through the telephone wires or stuff into these uh, optical terminals outside your house. And this is where it gets transferred into these optical terminals into uh, fiber optics, and then you get sent at the light, speed of light. And that's where we sort of feel like that, that's where you enter this abstract world uh, that we call the internet. So this is where they arrived. Uh, kind of the concept behind this is as the information gets packeted and sent through the fiber optics, you get separated into uh, different wavelengths of light. So when you enter, that's the color coding. Uh, in the middle there is, we took inspiration from the huge kind of underwater cables that run between the continents. And so if you could take a cross section, that's kind of what it looks like. And then in here we have um, these booths that you go and find your IP addresses. And so let's take a look at what we did with the internet. So back to the city idea, um, if the internet is a metropolis, then we wanted each building or the websites to be represented by a building. Um, and it has to be a kind of an endless uh, metropolis. We also didn't want each building to represent what the website looks like inside. So much like the arcade games, the world inside each website is very different from what it looks like outside. And another thing we wanted to do is to make sure that uh, Ralph and net users and Edison's, when they're in the internet, they don't want to be, we don't want to, them to feel like miniatures that are standing next to like large computer parts or hardware. And so we wanted to make sure that didn't happen. So here's uh, where we ended up with as our desi design language. Uh, this one is by, um, guy's name. Yeah, I think it's by Matthias. And so, there's that. Here is a lineup of some of those buildings. To give you a sense of scale, the one roughly in the middle is about the size of the Empire State Building uh, when, when Ralph is in the internet. And then obviously we couldn't build an endless uh, variety of buildings to, to kind of create this endless feel. So we wanted to give uh, each building variations so when they're kind of next to each other, uh, they have different colors, different designs. Uh, they look different from different angles to help with the variety. And also, uh, if you pepper on different signage and different orientations of signage, it helps to create that variation. Here is a lineup of some of the variation. We also did uh, fly-throughs through all of our environments. So we did fly-throughs of the internet. And this is to kind of test two things. Uh, creatively, we want to test how they look next to each other and see if um, we can get that endless variation to get the kind of a nice appealing uh, kind of skyscape, skyline going. And also, for one more thing, uh, we want to test technically if we can actually render this uh, and push it through our render farm. And here's Ernie to talk about that. Yeah, so uh, the, after the creative work was initially established and we did some layout tests to see if we um, liked how it would look flying through these buildings, we decided to do our first full render test, full looks, everything else. Um, and so we kicked off a test um, on our Hyperion renderer and the test never came back. So we knew that we had some work to do there. Um, and it, it's basically the sheer amount of, of geometry that's being dealt with with all the different types of buildings and, and their detail 
um, was, was something that wasn't going to brute force its way. So if we look at any, say, one example building, you have the outside of the building here um, that you can easily see, but then you have a whole inside guts as well for all the close-up fly-throughs and everything where you can see inside the windows of all of these buildings since glass is one of the big motifs. And then on the outside, there are also hundreds of screens with various uh, designs and logos on them. So if we uh, took these pieces all together, it was just too much data to be handling all at once. If we started instancing them individually as buildings, it was still uh, not going to be enough of a saving. So we had to get a little more intelligent about looking at any one of these individual pieces of parts in one building and seeing where and how it was duplicated across all the different types of buildings that were in, in, in the internet and just do a little larger scale sort of nested instancing and, and deduplicating of all of these uh, screens and interiors in order to uh, basically reduce the memory to a point where it could be handleable, renderable, and art directable um, for artists as we go through the pipe to be able to take designs like we have here and, and uh, turn it into the, the shots of the internet that you saw, such as this one here that was uh, renderable in a reasonable amount of time. Mike Yamada was the artist I forgot his name. Um, so let's take a little closer look at the street level of the internet. You know, we decided to go with a city f look because we wanted uh, the audience to be able to digest it fairly easily, so we keep the focus on the characters and their story. And so because it's a city, we want it to be a really lively, thriving city because it's the internet, so a lot, a lot of things are happening. Here's an early visit piece by, by Matthias, kind of show, uh, you know, it's, the street level has multiple levels, and you never see the bottom, and it's ever growing up, upwards. And here you can kind of enter a website through many um, kind of angles, because you can kind of get to a website in many different ways. Here's an intersection. There's like some fun things that he came up with. Uh, on the lower left, you have kind of people hanging out, handing out cookies outside a travel website. On the top center, you have people hashtagging the wall with spray paint. And then like in the middle of the intersection, there's a clock, but the clock's represented by the loading wheel. So as you're stopped at traffic, that's the time you're waiting uh, to get to your website. And how do we get around the internet? So net users on top, we get around, like users like us, we get around through these uh, links. And they basically take you from website to website. On the bottom, we have um, netizens, which are algorithms that are in the internet to help us you know, get around. And again, Dave will get into that later. But they can kind of travel freely as, you know, as they will. Uh, for example, like in an Amazon drone, or a mail truck, or a recycle truck. Here are some other details. We have like mailboxes and junk mailboxes. All the signage in our internet um, is international because you know it's a world wide web. We have uh, little street street lights and traffic lights. Uh, like a traffic light represents you know the top icons that you can close and open your windows. In addition to that, we have around the sidewalks of these kind of websites, we have these booths which could represent uh, like banners and stuff as you, as you browse a website. Uh, some examples are kind of music or book websites. You have an internet cafe, uh, website construction website. You can make your own website. And because the internet, you know, the web is ever growing, we pepper these around. So it's always under, you know, there's stuff always under construction, getting worked on or getting built. And what you know, a 3D printer idea was pretty fun since it's, uh, since it's the internet. So uh, one of the things you've noticed, we talked briefly about with the buildings, is that there were these, these billboards that had various screens and logos on them. Um, screen graphics is a very big part of the internet that we have. Um, this is just a, a small sampling of uh, the various artwork that had to be designed um, for the movie. And 
in order to create all of the, the designs that we needed for these signs, we had to recruit uh, the entire art department. And that's not just the art department that was on the movie, but pretty much everyone in the art department at the studio to take a couple weeks and just do designs for these signs. And that's for more of the static images, logos, things like that. But then we also have, uh, this was a, a shot that was work in progress, uh, video screens everywhere. And for that, we also went to the animation department when they were in between shows and, and asked them to, here's a, here's a box of uh, you know, all sorts of assets we have from our, all the movies we've made here, including, of course, lots of cats, as we saw earlier. Um, just have fun, come up with cute little videos that we can, can populate with in the scene. So there were definitely moments where pretty much everyone in the building was making content for our internet in the movie. Now, if you try to um, uh, work on looks for a typical building and you're applying a texture, we have a, a line in our shader, which is a, a texture module that you can plug in, you know, a PTEX map for uh, that particular thing. But with the amount of buildings we have and the amount of signs on each one that are also changing throughout the course of a shot, it would quickly start to look something like this or even hundreds of thousands more lines just to get one building looking like it needed to. So we had to create a new uh, sort of sequence map module for the shaders for dealing with sequences of image clips um, that could be uh, configured um, using a, a JSON config file for each of these to allow you to have uh, various numbers of clips of varying lengths and in each shot be able to start it at a different uh, frame time and switch at different amount of time, as well as uh, being able to then swap out any of these as needed. And basically sort of, um, here's, a, here's a sample of just uh, um, configuration for a, single, for a single texture, but you needed to um, be able to uh, look at a whole uh, library of what images you had available and videos you had available and then apply them to, uh, in this case, spheres, but in our typical movie it would be buildings and to all the signs, uh, randomly populate a large number if you wanted, but then be able to hand place and adjust uh, both when you're creating the assets, but then as it travels through the pipe, um, shot by shot needs as it's called out by the production designer or director if we see that there's two signs that are too similar close to each other or it's not working with the, uh, the color needs of that shot in a movie or it's just too busy with too much motion or anything like that, we need at any point in the pipe to be able to modify these as well and uh, render them out and, and select through them. And this led to basically being able to have uh, an early test of uh, very spherical buildings, but proving out what we'd be able to do with the signs in the internet um, that you can move through and, and constantly change in here. So in addition, <clears throat> in addition to the signage, we had a lot of holograms, and some of the signage were holograms. So we needed to develop a couple new functions with our shaders, with our shaders. Uh, the first one being the silhouette module. Uh, we had uh, these links had a very specific kind of art direction to them and kind of the other holograms as well. But, you know, using Hyperion, a uh, path trace principled shader or render, this doesn't really happen in real life. So we had to kind of come up with this, uh, this approach. And really we kept to the kind of the ray trace um, principle so here's an example of what's going on under the hood briefly. Uh, we have the object on the left, empty space on the right. Uh, there's a shading point, and we define a radius of how, you know, how wide we want this range to be. And then for each shading point, it returns a value from zero to one about the po probability of, it, of rays hitting that object. So with that, we can get a uh, kind of a grad defined by the radius uh, that you tell it. So here is that. And this is actually uh, two. There's actually two 
silhouettes, one for the thin bright line and then one for the soft grad towards the center. We also wanted to make sure that it works in, in our shots. So we, you know, we knew we had thousands, hundreds of thousands of vehicles flying around, so it needs to work uh, on stacked on top of each other. Here's kind of a closer look. And it's in world space, so um, if you zoom in, it, it actually looks you know, correct to how big it is on screen. And we also want to give it a test. Uh, because all the buildings are highly reflective, we want to make sure it all looks correct through all the reflections. So we threw it on Tamatoa and put him in a reflective box. And just to make sure you can see that in the reflections, you get the silhouette and not like a long smeared uh, reflection like you would with kind of camera-based maps. Second part to holograms, which is the bigger part, is uh, solid continuation. That's the name we came up with. We threw around the idea of the Princess Leia shader, but that didn't stick. Um, Dan Tees, our the main uh, software guy, came back to me with this drawing, with his idea. And I thought, yeah, that'll work. So here's what here's what's doing, really. Um, you shoot a ray, hits the object, uh, it sends a ray from the opposite direction and then hits the, opposite on the, re the object on the other side, and then it continues that uh, initial ray, and thus making the object you know, invisible, but really we get, the, we get the information from the first hit. So taking that through an example, here's three intersecting objects. You make it transparent, obviously you see the, uh, the objects on the inside and you see the backside. You can use kind of facing ratio ideas, but you still get the f faces that face to the camera. Um, here is, and I, here's where you show the, where it breaks down if you use maps. You can bake out maps per frame, uh, but that's a, that's a lot of work, and we have hundreds of signage and holograms in our shots. And so here it is, uh, working. Uh, you know, you can see it's seamless. It just works out of the box. You can, you can fade it on and off so you can kind of dial it in. We also want to make sure it, it works on everything. Um, this is, and you can see that on the left, on the right side, it works on reflections as well. You get the proper hologram look in all the reflections. And here we have it reacting to the lights in the scene. And we also have uh, it baked in, like the Princess Leia holograms. Uh, here's just showing it kind of before and after kind of what you would get. And here's a shot in the movie kind of showing like that cat, which is a hologram. Uh, it's not a very good render, but it is. And here's kind of the balcony shot you guys saw before. So in uh, designing uh, of Ralph Breaks the Internet, there were a huge variety of sets. We've talked most of the time about the Internet, but we had to start off with the sets from the original movie because there are sections that take place in the arcade and in all of those games. And while well, we still had some of those from the first movie, when we pulled them uh, all over into this one, we did have to touch, upgrade all of them, bring up to speed with modern rendering with uh, Hyperion, um, just you know, all the improvements that we've made over the course of time. On top of that, in the original movie, there were real world locations like Litwax Arcade. Uh, we had to bring those uh, over as well as designing new real world sets for this movie. And then there was the internet and not just the internet itself, but then all the different websites that they visited inside of the internet. When you take all of these together, there were over 150 unique sets that had to be built for this movie. And uh, to populate all of those, we ended up uh, building over 6,000 unique uh, assets. Uh, a large amount of those were built for this movie, but we also pulled forward uh, huge amounts from our past films. There was the original Wreck-It Ralph, but also we ended up using um, assets from pretty much every, every movie we've, we've made. Zootopia, Big Hero 6, uh, Moana, Tangled, even going all the way back to Bolt, some, uh, some props would come over and are scattered uh, throughout this movie. Um, 
just if you take one sample shot, like that balcony shot we've shown a couple times, in, in that shot alone for the environment, there were over 100,000 elements. And that's just in the environment. If we, uh, Dave will be following up talking about some of the crowds, the vehicles, as well as characters, uh, that goes well beyond that. Uh, and, and finishing up the movie uh, through lighting, our, our render farm was working hard, rendering about 1.9 million hours a day to get this movie done. And uh, now uh, handing it over to Dave to talk about characters. Great. Hey, everybody. Um, so I'm going to walk you through a little bit of the uh, character creation process on, on RAL. So um, initially, um, as Larry was saying, the Internet is, is, is a three-dimensional place. Um, the concept being is that the Internet's been around and it builds on top of each other, which is why you see older websites like Netscape or GeoCities way down at the bottom, a little bit defunct Alta Vista, those kinds of things. And then up towards the top, you'll have Google that just keeps going and going and going. So. Um, you, the, the issue that this brought to us was, you know, um, in, a, in a movie like Zootopia or Big Hero 6, you know, you've got hustling, bustling streets, you've got a lot of cars, you've got a lot of people wandering around, a lot of interaction, but, but in the internet, not only do I have that hustling, bustling street at street level, then I look down, I've got the same thing, I look up, I've got the same thing. So early on, um, we, we um, partnered with uh, our, our friends in uh, crowds and just ask them, you know what, just, just start scattering characters around here. Let's see what this means to populate the internet. And so this is uh, a clip that you saw earlier. It was our initial test, and um, it, 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 it was 150,000 characters at, at first glance. And we're like, oh, my God, this, this is just a test. What, this is going to be a huge movie. So uh, we knew we had our work cut out for us. And I'm going to walk you through a little bit of that today. Um, so... Just to kind of um, put things in, you know, comparison here, um, on, on the film Bolt, we had 57 characters total on that show. Um, we move into Wreck-It Ralph, and we have multiple worlds, right? We've got uh, the arcade, we've got um, Heroes Duty, we've got the different places that the characters journey to, so we needed to create unique populations uh, for those worlds. So, so we jumped up to 223 characters on that show just to, to fill that out. Uh, and then on top of that, we have 421 variants. And when I say variants, I'm not talking color swings. I'm talking things like uh, that will change a character's appearance, uh, geometry variants. So, so things like clothing changes, different faces, different rooms on characters in order to just fill out the ranks uh, and, and create extra characters for us. Um, we move on to Zootopia. Our character count went down a little bit because there's only so many characters that you can, um, I mean, there's so many animals you can make, right? Um, but our variants went up significantly because for every species that we created, we need, we need a mom, a dad, a daughter, a son, and then variation within their ranks. So uh, we, we got that through uh, variants as well. Uh, we move on to Ralph, and our, and our first thing was actually to, to bring over all of the characters, just like, uh, just like the guys were talking about with the sets, we brought over all of the characters from Ralph 1 minus 1, because Turbo didn't make it in the end. Um, so um, we ended up with 434 characters total on this show, because again, we started with those 200 characters from Ralph 1, um, and then we needed to create all the new worlds from there. So, uh, and a whopping 6,752 variants. And this, this is really, um, you know, to support the diversity and, and you know, the, just the dynamic uh, uh, internet that, that we've designed for this film. Um, if you layer in color swings on top of all of that, you've got well over a million unique characters on this film. So hopefully we never see the same one twice. Um, so, as I said, we started out bringing over all of our, um, all of our old characters from Ralph 1, and, and, you know, we didn't just port them over, but we wanted to, you know, we wanted to bring them, um, into our latest render, Hyperion. We wanted to, our technology has grown so much since we did the first Ralph. That's six years ago, so, as you guys are well aware, technology changes considerably within that time. Um, so we wanted to, uh, 
you know, really help us ourselves out on this film because there were a lot of challenges that we, we dealt with on the first Ralph. Like if you look at his legs, they're as, they're as long as they are wide. It's a bit like folding a bowling ball and that was very difficult for um, animation to pose uh, in a lot of shots and it would require a lot of cleanup. So we wanted to address things in rigging. We, um, we've made significant advances on our simulation so uh, we wanted to upgrade the sim on Ralph and Vanellope as well as our, our shading. So we used uh, path traced subsurface which you can see gives him a, a much warmer tone. Uh, and also the, the methods that we were using in the past had a tendency to wash out some of the detail on his face. So it was kind of surprising to us when we switched to our path ray uh, subsurface that suddenly all of this detail was coming out of, out, out of Ralph's brows that, that was being washed away in the past. And so we actually had to tone that down a little bit from the original model to bring him more onto model. But that was just the beginning of our process, and we did that for all of the characters from Ralph 1. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about uh, the netizens now. Um, in, with, with the netizens, we do have some key characters that Ralph and Vanellope will, will run into uh, that interact with them, and so I want to go through a couple of those. Um, as Larry mentioned, BuzzTube is one of the areas that we go to in the film, and, and the head algorithm of... Uh, BuzzTube is uh, a character named Yes, and she's voiced by uh, Taraji P. Henson. And so, um, Yes, Yes was originally, you know, the, the whole the whole thought behind Yes is that you know she's she is the curator of cool. She is like you know on top of everything that is hip, trendy. Uh, she, she, you know, she's the height of fashion. She's she was wearing the latest fashion two minutes ago, right? Um, so. So, um, you know, when, we, when we're talking about the height of cool and, and you know, the, the person that knows a lot of what's trendy and what's going on the internet, internet, the first place or the first thing that comes to mind is probably not us as adults, right? It's probably uh, a kid. Um, so we played around with the idea of, of uh, yes, being, um, you know, kind of an older sister to Vanellope. But it eventually uh, landed uh, on an adult is, um, because she was, she was the CEO of the company and we wanted her to be a little bit more business savvy. So um, as I said, she's, she's the height of fashion, she's the height of all that's cool. So we had to make a lot of outfits for her because she would be changing outfits almost every time you see her, uh, you know, and, and very stylish. Uh, but we had a lot of fun with that, right? Because what would what would style be on the internet, right? And so um, we we made a, a coat for her, uh, a faux for uh, fiber optic coat. And so you can see the little lights blink on, and there is animated noise kind of going throughout it. Uh, she she might have uh, you know data actually flowing through her hair. Um, you know, and so we really kind of played with this a lot and had, had fun with how these characters, you'll actually see in a lot of the netizens, you can see the data kind of in their faces and it's just a, it's a subtle little layer uh, under them as well. Um, and so this is a test uh, that our Tech Anim team did early on to uh, just see what that coat would play like. And so they, they pulled a lot of inspiration from uh, our older films, you know. So we looked at, like, Cruella de Vil for how the jacket would actually move. We wanted it to be a little bit over the top. Uh, and so we layered that in as well. But you'll notice, like, she's got, since she's a digital make, like, her earrings are kind of hologram earrings. They're not really... They're not really attached to her. They're just kind of floating there as if they are. Same with her glasses. Uh, she has... She has uh, data flowing through her outfit. You'll notice there's different glowing patterns that kind of turn on and off, uh, as well as her, her bracelet is just kind of floating there and, and animated the whole time. So uh, she's, a, she's a really fun character. Uh, one of the other characters uh, that we have in the show is um, Nosemore, which you've seen a little bit. Uh, he's, he's another one that uh, shows up that Ralph and Vanellope uh, wander into. So Nosemore... Uh, it, in early iterations of the film, he was, 
he lived down in the lower depths of the internet. He was he was a defunct like think Ask Jeeves or Alta Vista. Like he was he was kind of in search engines like that, and so uh, he was he was a little outdated. So we wanted to kind of give him an older uh, an older style, right? Uh, we played around a lot with shapes. Uh, we we used the shape of the light bulb because hey, I got an idea, right? Uh, to to play around with those kinds of things. Um, we we. You know, there was a point in time where he would just kind of pop all over the place, and you know, sit on sit on uh, Ralph's shoulder as he as he conversed with him. But we inevitably ended up with um, he he was actually the mascot for his own logo. So um, we we really liked this idea, and so we wanted to keep that style going with him. So with Nose More, um, you know, it was very much about that graphic uh, that graphic kind of. Uh, style uh, of the old 50s where we wanted that we wanted that um, that logo to evoke that one of the issues that we ran into was was bringing that graphic style into CG um, with the eyes in particular so the the glasses are those uh, those thick coke bottle glasses right and they're gonna they're kind of enhance the pupils uh, much like you've probably seen in a hundred different cartoons uh, the problem that we ran into is how do you achieve that, right? Do we, do we refract it? If we refract it, then it becomes very noisy. Uh, you get a lot of noise in there, and, and the, the, you, the read of the character isn't as clear as you'd like it to be. Also, the animators would be posing to look in one direction, but the refraction would shoot the eye line off in a different direction. So this all conflicted with the simple style that we, we wanted uh, to achieve on this. So we played around a lot uh, with the different, you know, different kinds of ways we can achieve this. Uh, and this is uh, a test that one of our animators, uh, or I'm sorry, our head of animation, uh, Renato Desanos, had done just to, just to kind of help figure out how we could do this. You know, there was, they wanted to convey a lot of emotion on this character as well. Um, so we inevitably ended up with a 2D approach on those glasses. So uh, the, the refraction, both the refraction and the eyes are actually hand drawn in this case. And then we, we match it to the CG background to, to really kind of bring it all together. So uh, here's, here's an early test of how that played out. Whoops, sorry about that. Okay, one more time. Yes. So this allowed us full control over that refraction. If you pay attention to the, the upper uh, screen right corner, you can see it kind of dials in and dials out as we want it to. Um, and we can also do a lot of fun things with the eyes as well. And here's an example of Nosemore walking through space. Again, keeping everything very simple and graphic, right? Uh, very intentional. Uh, and so, uh, Alan Tudyk, uh, who's, who actually started, wow, another anniversary, uh, actually started with us on uh, Wreck-It Ralph, and he's been a bit of our uh, luck charm for us, uh, has, has come back to, uh, to play the role of Nose More, and, and Alan's an extremely expressive guy. So as I said, there's a lot of characters in this film, um, and, and we started out just porting over all of the characters from, from uh, the original Wreck-It Ralph. Uh, you know, all the characters from Sugar Rush, uh, just the different games that we have, uh, as well as the humans. And as I said, they're not only, you know, in, in the original Ralph, there was, there was the humans in the arcade, but here we have representations of what we look like. So there's, we had to build new humans. And of course, the film is about the internet, so we have to have viruses, right? Uh, and and this, is, uh, this is our take on what the I Love You virus looks like. Um, uh, as long, I mean, and it's also Wreck-It Ralph, so we have to have games, right? There's apps that they'll travel to. You guys might be familiar with this from one of our earlier trailers. Uh, as well as, uh, as Larry mentioned, a, a, a brand new game that plays a pretty big role in the film called Slaughter Race. And uh, it was just announced uh, last Friday that Gal Gadot is going to be playing uh, the main character, Shank, and this is, this is our first look image of her. 
So uh, please join me in thanking the uh, panelists here for an awesome presentation, and we'll see you later this afternoon.